Hi there, this is Howard from avtransfers.co.uk. Welcome to the YouTube channel, our YouTube channel. If this is the first time you've popped by, welcome. And if uh, you've been here before, thanks for sticking with us. If you like what you see, please consider subscribing and uh, we'll be happy to show you lots more interesting things as time goes on. Today we're going to take a look at the Akai AVU8 amplifier, an integrated audiovisual amplifier back from the mid-1980s, I believe. This is something close to my heart because uh, when I was 13, I bought one of these as uh, a present for my birthday, my 13th birthday, and uh, I was very excited to have it because small televisions, compact televisions, handheld televisions were just a thing of imagination. When I was in South Africa, they were very restricted and unavailable unless uh, you went overseas. So uh, when I saw this television, especially when it went on to uh, discount price, I grabbed it. I spent every last cent I had to get one of these. And uh, as the years grew on, passed on, um, I'd lost track of where it went. I think I sold it or something like that. And uh, I thought I would rekindle that fire and find one online and show it to you. So stick around, let's take a look what we find. So this one, this example I found was not in a particularly fantastic condition. Um, a pretty much a lousy picture, but uh, I have a fond memory of the silver version of this. Um, and this one has got a very mocked, worn out power knob. So I didn't know what to make with that. But I just took a punt. You can see it's very dirty. There's a lot of tobacco glaze on it. Um, you can see the, how filthy it is here. Um, really not a pretty example at all. And um, you can see a lot of grossness. So I didn't know what to think, and um, I just took a punt on it. I really did. Um, it looks, it looks like it's all there, um, but there's no indication beyond that what's going on with it. Um, what was interesting, it had an, it had an English description, and uh, or maybe it's just translated it already. But what was interesting about it was it said a couple of useful things, which was. Um, power confirmed so it does power up and uh treat it as junk okay fine i get that so uh, i took a i took a punt and for the measly sum of 21 pounds i got that i won that auction so i paid for it and uh it came along in the water um i shipped it to the uk with an economy service so I, I just went el cheapo normally i get like special you know packaging and i thought you know for 20 bucks i'm just going to go cheap so the insurance in total came to 40 45 pounds uh, including the shipping so we're looking at a total of about 65 pounds now that's not bad that's with um economy fedex to the UK, so it's not as good as the other uh, systems, uh, FedEx options and DHL and whatnot, but I thought I'll just take a punt. So this came along and uh, it was pretty gross, to be honest. It was so gross, in fact, I was in a lot of suspicion that there was a lot of um, cockroaches and things, in which case I would just literally, you know, abandon the project because there's certain things I just won't touch. But I thought, let me take it outside and open it up. And I opened it up to discover it was not cockroaches or anything disgusting. It was just purely tobacco glaze. The machine inside was covered in a layer of carbon, like I don't know what from. It's either been on the whole time or it was smoked around. But the, the, the tobacco on the front of the machine was so thick, you couldn't even wipe it off with your finger. So I stripped it apart and uh, I put the top cover and the bottom cover in the dishwasher and uh, they came out beautifully so I decided to continue with the project and so we're going to take a look at this uh, this cleanup and uh, restoration so stay tuned so here we're taking a look at the uh, process uh, this is after I've actually stripped the machine down to its bare minimum and uh, I've basically the sub chassis and the top chassis I've run through the dishwasher and uh, cleaned man manually cleaned out the boards and used switch cleaner on the uh, controls 
and here I am sort of slowly putting things back together. I've had to soak the buttons in soapy water for about a day and then still rub them off, clean them off by hand because it was just in such a bad state. So it's looking a lot better now. Um, just having a look there, I'm working with gloves because there's still a bit of gross stuff all over it. And I'm just trying to find all the screws that I've misplaced or, or uh, misused in the process. And uh, it's a little bit of hit and miss with that, but not too bad. Just feeding the controls there, checking that they're happy, uh, sunshine, smiley face. Um, and uh, basically, unfortunately, the front panel doesn't clip off. All of those small boards actually clip into the front plate and then they've got to be individually screwed. So basically, it just becomes a real pain to service this machine. But uh, at this point now, we're looking at the video and um, we've basically cleaned the whole front panel. We've re reinstalled all of the buttons and the overlays. And now I'm putting the CRT tube back in uh, to the cabinet. And again, that screws into the front plate. So really, I was just hoping that the front plate would come off and I could just clean the whole unit, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't as easy as it looks. But this is generally dating back to a time when machines were designed to be not as serviceable as they were in the 70s, but certainly good enough that you could actually unscrew things and they wouldn't just break or, you know, crack when you opened it up. And because there's a lot of metal and glass, it's, it's quite a hefty design. It's a, it's a serviceable unit. So there I'm just replacing the, the mount that goes around the tube, um, screwing it back in and uh, cleaning a clean cleaned a lot of the, the wiring that goes in. Um, that's the high voltage anode, which uh, I'm just using my sort of uh, gloves to help pull back the, the, the suction cup, get that connected in. Um, and there goes the, um, the yoke connection. Um, and then basically just reseating the front panel back in. So some of the boards that are in on the bottom of the amplifier actually sit on top of the metal brackets that attach the front panels to the front. So it's, it's a, I think the word is a ball ache, I think would probably be the best description, but it's not the worst ball ache, because at least when you open it up, you don't have a thousand springs popping out as you as you open it up, say you would in a mechanism. But slowly, slowly, you can see I'm working it back in there and uh, just finding where all the screws go. Um, you know, if you miss half the screws in this particular design, it's not going to make the end of the world. But uh, it's obviously nice to put all the screws back in where they are. And there's a little earth uh, cable, which I wrestled with quite a bit to get that in. Uh, I'm still wrestling with it there. But obviously you want all those cables to be tied down, to be screwed in. I just found that moving it around in three dimensions did sometimes help. Uh, I had to occasionally go under the carpet, under the table to find off the screws because they have a way of rolling off and onto the floor. Um, but I, the feeling is I'm getting there. I'm definitely getting there. That little uh, metal container is what holds the uh, high voltage um, uh, section of the, the tube. So this has been totally cleaned now. The whole face plate has been de tobaccoed All the components, knobs have all been individually cleaned. The circuit boards and all the switches have been given switch cleaner. I've not replaced any components, but I've checked all the fuses. It's nice to see something with a lot of fuses. Um, remounted the Trump power transformer. I've used a dishwasher to, to actually clean the, the whole sub chassis, which I stripped out. I, I used dish, dish uh, washing uh, soap to clean the front. I cleaned the tube, I cleaned all the high voltage muck off. I've cleaned the metal top. And uh, I've resprayed the power switch with uh, a primer because the original switch was worn down to the black and uh, didn't look very nice. So at least that looks like it matches. So it's looking really, really good. Submitted for your approval, one Akai AV U8 amplifier, fully cleaned, 
and refurbished. I'm pretty sure this machine was never opened all of its life. It was well used, but judging by the way, there were no scratch marks, no opening marks, and um, everything came off beautifully in the dishwasher. Um, that is a beautiful amp. I could put power on there, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, I've cleaned behind the glass, and I also wanted to check that there were no cockroaches or gross insects inside, and I've confirmed there was nothing at all inside other than tobacco. Looking at the back, um, you've got a whole lot of things, your standard audio, I could probably clean these there, but tobacco-y as well, turntable, turntable ground tuner, auxiliary tape loop, video in for a tuner, the Laserdisc VTR, two VTRs, output for a monitor, RF output for a television, preamp out for a power amp, and your channel selector, and of course your speaker outputs, and your power. Pretty cool, a really nice amp, and cleaned up really well, in fact, um, it's just, it's just, it's, it feels like it's actually new, because of the fact that we went to the dishwasher, there's a vertical hold adjustment, so if that is out, we can adjust it there, which I suspect it well, well might be. But for now, that's a pretty cool amp. Well, I hope you enjoyed that rather misguided and uh, wasted afternoon with me fixing the Akai AVU8, which is now proudly in my NTSC rack. Why NTSC rack? Well, even though the monitor does uh, work on PAL and NTSC, if you set the horizontal hold somewhere in the sweet spot between them. It is mainly an NTSC model. I do have the PAL version as well with the PAL modulator. This has got the NTSC modulator and uh, it's running on 100 volts. And I've got a lot of other machines here which are NTSC 100 volt Japanese machines. The SL200D, which is the last of the Betamaxes, I believe. Uh, which has auto tracking, another machine that I refurbished, which I didn't do a video on, but a very plasticky machine. But the only machine with auto tracking, um, there's an HF950. It's the only odd odd duckling in the uh, pile because that's a PAL one, but it just happens to be where I put it. Um, there's the SL2100, a nice machine as well. An SL, sorry, an EDV8000 and a whole lot of other NTSC machines. Um, the video stabilizer I did a video on some time ago, um, an NTSC um, for a time-based corrector, and of course the big one-inch uh, VTR there, which is uh, feeding into SDI via the uh, time-based correctors and into a Blackmagic recorder. A real NTSC explosion happening here. But let's have a look at the Akai. Thanks for watching, and if you like this kind of stuff, please consider subscribing. Howard, that's my name. avtransfers.co.uk, just another Michigan out there. Thanks for watching. Adios. Just a bit of fun on a Saturday afternoon. some reason I don't have color on that I think there's a bad cap in that one but if I go to S video we'll fix it up how about we uh, freeze that one for a sec how's that for an effect I like these amps, these are cool. Yeah, the late Tom Petty, another brilliant musician. Mind you, the tint on this is quite horrible, eh? You can just, you can't just, ma you just can't match Sony color and JVC color. There's just no comparison. They're both good. It's very hard to match the color.